You may recall back, it seems ages ago now, I believe it was in uh, the first lecture, I presented a set of what I termed, uh, I believe, motivating scenarios at that point, uh, sort of posing some questions on how you might approach certain kind of situations uh, with the idea of sort of thinking about that and then revisiting it uh, to talk about how we would approach it given the kinds of things that we've talked about during the course. So I'm going to revisit those and, and talk about some, some approaches that have been used in the past using some published examples. And let's start with our first one. Uh, the first one was a situation where there was this uh, volatile organic compound, which we'll just uh, just give it a hypothetical name here, a VOCX. So let's say we need to characterize the risk of uh, of, uh, of environmental exposure uh, to human workers by having some VOCX vapors in the air. Uh, it's known to cause a range of adverse health effects, uh, but and because of its toxicity, uh, we can't perform controlled studies that actually involve administering VOCX to humans. Uh, as a result, we have no direct knowledge about the toxicokinetics uh, of VOCX, uh, nor the relationships between things like atmospheric exposure, systemic exposure, and toxicity uh, in humans. Uh, now, we do have some such information done in an experimental setting for three other species and some limited information available for closely related compounds. And by I mean limited human information. Uh, let's assume that's probably something like uh, somewhat observational studies done in the working place for a few other compounds uh, that provide some information about some of those components. So the question is, is how would I use that kind of information? How would I synthesize it or integrate it in order to make some quantitative infer inferences about the probable range of systemic exposure and toxicity in humans given different possible uh, levels of exposure in the workplace? And then, you know, how would I... You know, not only do I want sort of point estimates out of that, I want to be able to characterize my uncertainty around these inferences so I can begin to say things about the probable range of toxicity and, more importantly, the probability of having, uh, have, having various uh, toxic consequences in humans. Well, for, for the example, let's, let's consider uh, a, a particular approach that will take advantage of of sort of two things uh, that we've got to work with, sort of two uh, uh, areas of specialty, shall we say. Uh, one is going to be making use of, use of Bayesian inference, and the other one is going to be making use of our physiologic knowledge. And the way we're going to bring those together uh, is using physiologically based models. So what we're talking about here then is a Bayesian approach to physiologically based models, or as I'll refer to it here, PBPK models. And I argue that that's advantageous for combining physiologic knowledge uh, where that knowledge, of course, is not generally, it's, it's knowledge where there's some uncertainty uh, involved in it. So as I say here, we've got our physiologic knowledge, which ranges in the degree of uncertainty uh, in terms of the quantitative aspects of that physiologic knowledge. There's even to some degree we could bring in some some of the uncertainty in the qualitative aspects, but let's just focus on the, the quantitative aspects. And when we bring those two together, the result is a more comprehensive approach than the, the sort of typical approaches that you, or I say typical, but oh, let's call them classical approaches to PBPK modeling. Classically, when people that approach PBK PK modeling, they did in fact bring in prior information uh, into that modeling process, but they did not bring in uh, formalisms for incorporating the uncertainty. Uh, so you would start out with an a priori model, a priori in the sense of both the model structure, but also a priori in the sense of the parameter values for that for that model. But we, instead of bringing in, as we do in a Bayesian context, uh, those parameter values uh, as 
prior distributions that have some uncertainty, they would have been brought in as just fixed single value, uh, single values into this, uh, and uh, so you would you take those fixed values, you take your models, and then when you use the model in order to assess the adequacy of the model, you would generate point predictions uh, for different doses or uh, and times and so on, and then you'd compare those point predictions to new data. Uh, and in doing so, you're not really fitting the, in, the models to the data. You're just simply predicting the data and saying the model is adequate or not based upon how well it compares uh, to the observed data. Uh, then I suppose the other extreme uh, that uh, that it was occasionally attempted was to actually try to apply conventional nonlinear regression strategies uh, to to PBPK modeling. But of course, with most PBPK models, there's a very large number of parameters in there. So what was typically done uh, in well, one the because there were so many, it was not possible to estimate all of those parameters using a, a conventional nonlinear regression strategy. So what was typically done was to pick a subset of those parameters that the modelers had less certainty about and attempt to fit those while fixing uh, the remaining parameters. And of course, the selection of the subset of parameters to be fit was a largely arbitrary one. Uh, in terms of where you draw the line between, uh, you know, what do you fit and what do you simply fix based upon prior information. Uh, the argument here in the Bayesian framework is you don't need to choose between these two extremes, basically assuming certain values as though they are known with certainty, uh, or in the other extreme, uh, treating some of the parameters as known with certainty, but others as though you know nothing about them other than the new data in hand. The Bayesian method gives you a, uh, a, uh, a an in-between strategy that allows you to specify the prior information, but also specify the uncertainty in that prior information, and then and then and then use Bayesian updating uh, as new data comes into play. Uh, in order to get then posterior distributions to support your subsequent inferences. <coughs> Excuse me. So for our Bayesian method then, we're going to be using a complex model uh, that has some physiologically relevant parameters in it. These would be things like oh, tissue blood flows, tissue volumes, tissue blood partition coefficients, uh, and so on. At least those would be the typical for the uh, pharmacokinetic models. If we were also looking at pharmacodynamic models, there might be other elements in there, such as uh, uh, maybe various characterizations of, uh, of receptors and so on. Uh, then we're going to have prior distributions that are going to be based upon a combination of information sources about those quantities. Uh, this will include our, our physiologic knowledge, uh, is part of this and also some non-clinical data that might be derived from either animal or in vitro experiments uh, to uh, to support our estimates of those prior distributions. Uh, and then when we, uh, let's see, where am I going here? Oh, sorry. Uh, then we can analyze new data uh, as it's accrued and the results that you get out of it then would be expressed in probabilistic terms in other words, our posterior distributions that communicate the uncertainty in our predicted quantities and our inferences, you know, as well as the model parameters. Uh, and again, I'm trying to contrast this here with sort of the classic PBPK approach where the results would be expressed only as point estimates without measures of uncertainty. Uh, in this case, now we do have measures of uncertainty that are more readily translated into uh, inferences about things like uh, degree of exposure uh, as well as maybe degree of risk associated with some exposure. I uh, just wanted to point you here to some uh, some literature that I, I suggest you take a look at. Uh, the the er There was some early work done in bringing together Bayesian methods with uh, physiologically based modeling, uh, and among the best of that is some stuff that uh, Frederick Bois and uh, and Andrew Gelman 
uh, had done together. In particular, uh, Frederick Broad uh, increasingly been had been involved a lot in um, in toxicokinetics, uh, particularly toxicokinetics. Uh, as a result of environmental exposures to various compounds uh, and had been sort of gradually working up a more uh, stochastic approach uh, to that kind of modeling. And at some point he had formed a collaboration with Andrew Gelman, who's a uh, a well-known statistician, Bayesian statistician, uh, and they had uh, done some very good work together back here uh, preceding 1996. So the uh, this article in particular, the one where Andrew Gelman is a lead author, uh, which is in uh, the Journal of the American Statistical Association, does a particularly nice job of describing not just the methodology but also the rationale underlying the use of Bayesian methods with the physiologically based models. And then these other two articles are uh, some specific examples, excuse me, from right around that time where they applied it. Uh, since that time, uh, Bayesian methods have become uh, much more commonly used in the environmental toxicology uh, community uh, to the point where you might almost call it a standard methodology now within that within that environment. Uh, right now, pharmaceutical development is uh, is sort of lagging behind uh, the use of it, but I, I definitely see a, a strong role for that kind of approach, particularly during early clinical development or even preclinical development of drugs. So anyway, I encourage you to take a look at those, particularly the uh, this JASA article here. But let's take a look at uh, some work from that time, uh, though newer work has refined uh, the approach. It, it hasn't fundamentally changed. Uh, so I think even looking at this early work is, uh, is worth doing. It probably does, a, uh, if you look at later work, it tends to assume you understand the rationale behind the whole thing. If you look at the earlier work, it'll give you a, a better grounding. Uh, in the use of it. So let's take a, a typical uh, PBPK model here. Uh, this is actually a relatively small one in some ways. You can see it's a, it's a five compartment model here. Uh, for the most part there's actually a few other c components but the main compartments are the five that you see in the middle. Uh, and each of those represents either an organ or a uh, collection of organs. So you can see here, so we've got a well-perfused set of organs, a poorly perfused set. We've got fat, bone marrow, liver uh, in here. Uh, you do have formation of metabolites as part of this, uh, this process. And all of these components are, uh, are interconnected in terms of blood flows. So you've got arterial blood flows into the organs, and then you've got venous blood then flowing out of each of these organs. Uh, this particular example is, is from a Bois article where he was looking at benzene uh, in this case. So we end up taking this model. Uh, it ends up being then a, uh, a system of differential equations. Uh, you can see there's a Vmax KM component, so it's pretty evident that at least part of this is going to be uh, at least one of those equations is going to be a nonlinear differential equation as part of this. So you've got a system of at least five differential equations as part of this. And if this, if the stuff at the bottom is being modeled, that would add a few more. And so you would, uh, in fact, that's I'm jumping to the results. So you'd take such a model. Uh, you would, you've seen in our example four that certainly it's possible to put in such differential equations into a model uh, and and you can then uh, do the the Bayesian updating as new data is accrued into this but the key thing here is this idea that each of the parameters represented within this model would be things where you already had a significant amount of prior information about them that would actually be incorporated then as, in, as informative prior distributions into the model. Uh, and in the many of the examples that were done, uh, that Bois et al. had done, uh, he would have taken such a model, he would have uh, 
updated them based upon some new animal experiments that he had. Uh, in this case, doing a population model. So he's actually got inter-animal or inter-individual variation uh, as part of his model. Uh, and he has his own little software package that he puts together for this that he calls MC Sim. Uh, so if you're curious about that, you can go out and take a look at the uh, literature on that. Uh, so he's got that package that he uses for doing this. Uh, he can update it. Uh, in some instances, the model may also include some interspecies scaling component, in particular scaling from various uh, non-human species uh, and scaling to humans in order to make inferences about human exposure. Uh, and in a few cases, he may have some limited information about the uh, outcomes of human exposure. But of course, in that case, he usually only has observations at things like venous blood as, a, as opposed to ma information about exposure in some of these individual tissues that he might have from animal studies. This is just an illustration of the kinds of results they were producing for this uh, benzene example in here, uh, where I'm trying to remember the exact rationale. They were looking at it in detail about some of these components, but just to illustrate some elements here, uh, he's got a situation where some of the some metabolites are being formed in the bone marrow and he's got a uh, a prediction here about the metabolites produced per day by bone marrow versus uh, the inhaled exposure expressed as part per million uh, so he's got that where he's got you know like a posterior median and some credible intervals about that or in this case I guess he actually just wrote them as uh, uh, is actually these are population standard deviations so these standard deviations include a combination of both the uncertainty in the posterior distribution as well as the inter-individual variation as part of that. Uh, he's also got an estimate of this fraction of benzene metabolized per day uh, in here again these are this is a posterior distribution reflecting both the uncertainty and variability but the point here is he's able to express this uncertainty uh, in the degree of exposure and of a particular consequence of that exposure uh, rather than simply getting a point estimate as part of this uh, and then that the that original paper by Gelman et al makes the argument that certain components of the analysis are either necessary or desirable uh, in order to make this process work. Uh, he argues that five key, about five key features, all of which work in combination, one being a physiologic model, then a population model, in other words, a model describing uh, inter-individual variation in this instance, uh, the prior information on the various population physiologic parameters, uh, some experimental data, and then Bayesian inferential procedures, and that all of those work together. Uh, and again, he argues that uh, if any of those five features are missing, the model wouldn't work. Argues that if uh, if the first one, and I should have wrote what these are, so number one would be a physiologic model. So without a physiologic model, there's no good way to obtain prior information on the parameters, because in our you know our typical classic more empirical models, the individual parameters do not have direct physiologic interpretation. As a result, it's very difficult to get uh, to get prior information about them uh, unless you've essentially done a very similar experiment in the past. Uh, and then without a population model, there's generally uh, not enough data to estimate the model independently in each individual. So if you want to make inferences about individuals, uh, you couldn't do that without the population model. Um, number three and four, so that's what? That's our uh, prior information and our experimental data. So the parameters of our multi-compartment physiologic model cannot be determined accurately by only data or by prior information alone is being argued. So those two components are necessary. And then finally, the Bayesian inference yields you a distribution of parameters consistent with both the prior information and data. Uh, and he adds the term if agreement is possible in this case. Uh, what he what the statement that he made originally doesn't make clear though is that the reason why you want this is because if you were looking at the consequences of things like an environmental 
exposure to some uh, toxic toxin. Uh, we don't want to just get a point estimate out of here, particularly if our predictions are particularly uncertain. We want to make a statement about the probability of certain consequences, like you know the uh, probability of uh, you know of of cancer or some other adverse event occurring uh, in an individual if they're exposed to a certain level of a particular chemical. Uh, and if all you get is a point estimate, uh, I suppose you have some rough idea whether the potential for exposure is great or small, but but it doesn't give you much of a basis for, say, even making policy arguments if you can't say how certain you are of that particular prediction. And I guess uh, what a, this is an area that I know I've gotten a fair amount of interest in in general is beginning to look at more mechanistic modeling approaches and combining Bayesian methods with those. And I would, uh, particularly if you're interested in things like, uh, you know, things like transi transitional development applications of modeling and simulation, I'd encourage you to start looking uh, in that particular direction. Uh, is something that would allow you to bring the value of modeling and simulation earlier into the development process uh, and to get more uh, more value out of that modeling and simulation effort. Okay, let's go on to our, our the second scenario we had looked at. Actually, maybe before I do that, let me see if you've got, if you have a question on the first one before I confuse it with a, another topic. Okay, nothing so far here. I'll go ahead and uh, continue on here. Uh, let's take a look at our, our second scenario. Uh, and let's suppose that uh, you're developing some drug, we'll call it drug X, and you need to uh, recommend a dose or dose range for drug X that optimizes the trade-offs between benefits and risks. Let's say that phase two has been completed uh, and the dose response information is available for key efficacy and safety related outcomes for your drug X treatment. So how would I synthesize the cumulative quantitative evidence that you have on safety and efficacy in order to predict the outcomes for various doses? Uh, then how would I quantify the uncertainty in those predictions? Of course now that I've got the predictions then how would I use them in conjunction with patient and prescriber opinions about accessible, acceptable risk relative to benefit in order to choose what's an optimal dose? Because simply knowing, you know, the degree of efficacy and the probability of, of some adverse events isn't enough to tell you what's sort of the optimal balance between the two. Uh, you have to somehow weigh, you know, the severity of the adverse events, for example, uh, compared with and the value associated with that by patients and prescribers. Uh, you need to weigh that against uh, the benefits that you're getting. So how would we do that? Well, let's look at a how we might look at that from a Bayesian point of view. Uh, and what we're going to look at is... Bayesian decision analysis and using that to optimize a treatment regimen. And in this case, the example I'm going to use is some work uh, that some folks did here. We've got uh, what Gordon Graham, Sunil Gupta, and Leon Ahrens involved in this one. Uh, you can see the title here. So it says Determination of an Optimal Dose Regimen Using Bayesian Decision Analysis of Efficacy and Adverse Effect Data. And what they've shown in this is um, you know, it, it's a somewhat simplistic example in the sense that they're only going to look at one efficacy outcome and one uh, adverse effect outcome in order to support a decision. And, of course, in many cases, the decision involves a more complicated collection of, of drug attributes when you do this. But the basic principle still applies even if you're going to try and incorporate 
uh, say other measures of efficacy, adverse effects, and you know, and maybe other attributes about uh, the drug and the dosage form you're using. So we're going to look at here, uh, it's using Bayesian pharmacodynamic modeling coupled with decision analysis to op optimize uh, a dosing regimen for oxybutynin. Uh, oxybutynin, amongst other things, is uh, used to treat urinary incontinence. So that's the indication we're interested in. Uh, the efficacy uh, measure we're going to be looking at is going to be looking at the number of urinary incontinence incontinence episodes per week. So that's our measure of efficacy. Uh, and the, the authors had developed a population pharmacodynamic model uh, based upon using a, a, a Poisson model for the, uh, for the count of uh, urinary incontinence, in, sorry, incontinence episodes. Uh, so, so in other words, their, their likelihood function in this case is a Poisson distribution to describe those. Uh, the toxicity in this case is going to be dry mouth measured on a four-level ordinal scale, uh, zero to three. And I don't remember which, do I know which way it goes? Let's see if I, real quick here. I don't know which way they uh, corresponded, but basically, the I don't know if they started from severe to less severe or the other way around, but basically they would have had a scale of n no dry mouth at all, probably minimal dry mouth, uh, moderate, and severe. Uh, so that was more or less what they would have been describing. Uh, in this case, they had a population pharmac pharmacodynamic model for dealing with uh, such ordinal uh, observations. Uh, actually, if you're not familiar with terminology, ordinal is just a shorter way of use of saying ordered categorical observations. Uh, so they used a model for that. Uh, and so they built the model on this and then they applied Bayesian decision analysis. And what I'm attempting to do here in one slide is give you sort of a thumbnail sketch of of what Bayesian decision analysis is. Uh, fortunately, you've already got a couple of the pieces under your belt from the course. So let's first of all talk about uh, this term utility and, and what it represents here. Uh, so first of all, we've got our parameters here, theta. Uh, here you see I use the term I described the state of nature, but what I really mean is this is theta then represents the parameters of our model that predicts our consequences, which I'll call C, of some action A. And even before I go down to the rest of this, the whole notion underlying Bayesian decision analysis will be we've got some choice amongst a collection of possible actions, so like an A1, A2, A3, if you like. Uh, in some cases, it may even be a continuous uh, range of possible actions. Uh, but in our case, we'll keep it simple. Let's say we've got a limited set of actions here. We'll call each, so generically they're A, any individual one, you'd probably put an uh, index on it or something. Uh, and if you take such an action, there would be some consequence to that action. In, in our case, that we're going to be interested in the act, range of actions of interest would be the different possible doses of oxybutynin. So any particular dose of oxybutynin would be the action you would choose, the, the action. So, the, so we want to pick, we want to optimize what dose we're going to have. In other words, we're optimizing our choice of A here, our action. Uh, now, of course, if you administer a particular dose level, there are going to be consequences to that. Uh, the consequences in this case we're going to focus on are either uh, the number of urinary incontinence episodes per week, or it will, you know, so that's one type of consequence. The other type of consequence here will be uh, the uh, magnitude of dry mouth in here. So when we say consequences here, C then is going to be our, the combination then of our dry mouth and urinary incontinence episodes. Okay, so, but anyway, theta is, you're used to, that's our parameters, uh, and we've got associated with that parameter, uh, in this case I'm showing it as a posterior distribution here, uh, given whatever data we've got. Our, our y just representing data, you know, the observations. 
uh, and in our case that's going to be a mix of observed values for our dry mouth measurement and our urine, number of urinary incontinence episodes and so we've got some model describing both of those so we've got a set of parameters related to that and our posterior distribution of those is our theta here so again a we've talked about it that, that is representing the uh, our action that we're trying to decide on which has our consequence c which i have down here uh, and let's see so again we've got some C is going to be our consequence of action. Uh, I probably made this a little overly complicated in here that I'm implying that uh, that not only do we have a a model relating our action to our parameters, but there's the possibility that even for a fixed value of of each, there may still be some additional random uncertainty in our in our consequences. Uh, but for the most part, yeah, they don't agonize too much over that. Uh, then we have what we term the utility of our consequences, uh, which is going to be some measure. Uh, let's see, did I ever? Yeah, I guess I really didn't give you a good phrasing on here. Uh, a utility now is going to be, first of all, it's going to be a, it's going to be a scalar valued quantity. That's what, I'm, that's what I mean by this little term here where I say the utility of a particular consequence is going to be somehow coming from the real line. So it's, it's just going to be a single value for any given uh, consequence. Uh, there will be a utility which measures... Uh, it measures utility. I'm trying to f uh, think of... I should have thought of some good words for this before I started this. Uh, it really it's an attempt to measure um, the relative gain well if it's if I've written it as utility it's usually implying a gain of uh, associated with these consequences so in our case where we're going to be looking at the trade-offs between uh, the number of urinary incontinence episodes and the degree of dry mouth we want a this utility should be a function such that it gets bigger as efficacy improves in other words as the frequency of urinary incontinence episodes goes down uh, but the utility should go down uh, as the degree of dry mouth goes up uh, and the trick is is to come up with a utility function that appropriately weights those two consequences so that it's consistent with the perceptions of the, in this case, mainly the patients, uh, in terms of you know what what do they see as the appropriate trade-off between uh, you know between decreasing their urinary inco urinary incontinence uh, while at the same time not having too much dry mouth. Or put another way, it's kind of like uh, you know what odds would they tolerate between these things? Uh, you know how much how much dry mouth are they willing to tolerate, for example, in order to decrease the number of urinary incontinence episodes by half? Uh, anyway, so you want to come up with an appropriate weighting that takes into account those trade-offs. Uh, and then finally, that the real utility that we're going to be focusing on is sort of this one function right here, where I say utility is a function of our model parameters and of the particular actions. So that's going to be the utility of an action given the current state of nature, in other words, given a particular set, set of parameter values. Uh, and here I'll list a little bit here is down, doing down here is just taking a, an average over this particular uh, probability distribution. But this is the one we're going to be most interested in. In fact, for the example we're going to look at, we don't even have the complication of this extra probability distribution in here. So we're going to be pretty much writing this u, uh, this u as a function of parameters and actions. Uh, pretty much directly for this example. Now, under Bayesian decision analytic theory, the optimal decision to make, in other words, the optimal A to pick here, is going to be you want to take the action that maximizes the expected utility. In other words, we're going to be taking this utility here uh, and averaging over our posterior distribution of our parameters, theta. 
So that's what this statement is saying here. So our optimal action then is going to be to take that function and average over our posterior distribution, which you can see over here. So here this is just showing uh, the expectation process here uh, over theta, over our posterior distribution of theta. And then what you have to do then is that'll give you some function of A, our actions, and what you want to do is find out, okay, where is the, what A maximizes uh, this expectation. So let's make that a little more concrete, since that was all very abstract, I think. And let's put it in terms of the oxybutynin example. Uh, so we've got our the proposed utility that the authors chose here uh, is shown right here. Uh, here I've just shown it as a function of the action, which in this case would be selection of a dose. Uh, and the talked about this in terms of some weight multiplying utilities associated with the two outcomes. So we have a weight uh, related to our dry mouth multiplied by the utility, uh, a utility metric here for dry mouth. Uh, and same thing for our efficacy measure here. We've got this weight times this utility, and these utilities here are defined on this. Now, technically, it's only the overall quantity that's truly a utility, but they were referring to these as utilities here. Really, just think of them as being functions of, of the dose. So we've got one here, which is we've got some measure of the degree of toxicity and some measure of the degree of efficacy here. Uh, and in the case of efficacy, the, what they chose to use is, the, is a simple binary utility, which will take on the value of 1 if the expected urinary incontinence event rate uh, for a given dose is less than 6. So if there's less than 6 urinary incontinence episodes per week, uh, you basically say the drug worked and we'll give it a 1. Uh, if the expected uh, urinary incontinence event rate is bigger than 6, then you say, ah, that wasn't good enough, and we're just going to call it 0. Uh, so, they, so again, it's a fairly simplistic binary thing in this case. Uh, arguably, you could probably use a continuous scale instead, but that was the, uh, uh, what they came up with. Uh, then for the toxicity, uh, they translated the the ordinal scale uh, into uh, a set of, actually in a sense, a set of three different measures, but they sort of broke down the scale. So recall we have a three-level scale. Two of the levels in there are one is uh, severe dry mouth and the other is moderate. And then there's two, uh, two, are two lesser levels. So basically if they had mild or no dry mouth, uh, then, uh, you know, then the degree of toxicity would be essentially zero. Or actually, I guess they, let's see, which way does this go? Okay, yeah, it would be a zero on this. Uh, so let's see, where are we going here? So what they did is said, okay, well, if the probability of severe dry mouth is less than 10% and the probability of moderate dry mouth is less than 70%, they'd consider that pretty good and, and, assign that a value of zero. Uh, on the other hand, if there, if the probability of dry, of severe dry mouth was greater than 10%, uh, but, well, it's sort of intermediate, two intermediate cases. We have one where the probability of severe is bigger than 10, but the probability of moderate is less than 70%. Or if the probability of severe is less than 10%, but the probability of moderate is greater than 70%, they gave it a value of minus 0.5. And then finally, if the probability of severe dry mouth exceeded uh, 10% and the probability of moderate also exceeded 70%, they gave it a minus 1. So that would be that was their most severe case in this instance. Uh, so... So where are we going? So that's what they ended up putting together. So, and you can see that as the efficacy goes up, 
the metric here gets more positive. As the toxicity goes up, it gets more negative. I guess they're assuming that Wtox and Wf are, are positive values here. And so you can see there's a trade-off, and the degree of the trade-off is going to also depend upon what the, the weights are, what weights are chosen here. Uh, so assuming they choose appropriate weights to be uh, to really reflect uh, patient preferences here, then uh, they should get an optimal oxybutynin dose by maximizing then the expected value uh, of this utility up here. Uh, and this expectation then is is one where you're averaging over both the interpatient variation and the uncertainty in our model parameters in order to get that. So keep in mind they've built a model for the toxicity, they build a model for the efficacy. Uh, the parameters in there have uncertainty. So these predicted values that they have down here are going to have uncertainty around them. Uh, but in order to pick the optimal dose, you end up averaging over uh, that uncertainty and variability. And this is just giving you a depiction of this. So here we've got what they call the UF and down here the UTOX. Uh, and you can see, and this is plotted versus dose. Uh, Part of the story they had in the article here is they had two different dosage forms also. They had an immediate release and a sustained release. So amongst other things, they were comparing uh, those two different uh, dosage forms. Uh, but you can see in general here then that as the dose goes up, not too surprisingly, the efficacy is going up. Uh, and as the dose goes up, the toxicity uh, well, the toxicity is going up in a sense, but keep in mind our, our utility here is going down as the toxicity goes up and it takes on negative values. So, and then when you do the weighted average of those two, depending on what is chosen for weights, you get a picture like we have on the right-hand side. So here, the y-axis is that combined utility function versus dose. And in this case, now we get a curve that rises and falls. Uh, and, the, of course, that's a consequence of the fact that mainly as at lower doses, our efficacy is going up uh, to a degree greater than our uh, toxicity. But at some point, uh, there's turnabout where the toxicity gets too severe and you end up with an overall drop off as doses get higher. And, and, but what we end up doing then to pick our optimal dose is look for where the peak is on this relationship. Uh, and in this particular example, you can see that uh, the peak is in roughly the same place for both the uh, for both dosage forms. So the optimal dose for both dosage forms appears to be about 10 milligrams uh, by the metric they're using here. Although I need to remind you that where that optimal value comes in here is going to depend upon uh, you know all the elements of the utility function, but in particular, it would be depend it would depend on the values they chose here for Wtox and Wf, uh, and to pick what the appropriate values are. Again, they need to weigh uh, the subjective elements of patient or prescriber preference into that. Okay. Uh, so that was the end of that example. To, again, to illustrate bringing in uh, the Bayesian modeling itself, but also bringing in Bayesian decision analysis at that point. Okay, so let's go on to our, our third scenario here. And the scenario here is uh, one where, let's say, you need to develop a phase two strategy for a new drug that has an unprecedented mechanism of action for treating some life-threatening disorder for which there's no, uh, no effective treatment currently on the market. Uh, let's suppose there's large uncertainty in whether the known pharmacologic effects of the drugs will even translate into therapeutic benefit. And there's even more uncertainty in what the dose response might be for both efficacy and safety-related outcomes. Uh, because of these two rather large sources of uncertainty, 
uh, a conventional dose finding strategy, you know, dose finding trial where you might try maybe, oh, say three to four active doses uh, in a dose finding trial would have a pretty high risk of failing to yield good dose response information. Uh, you know, with that much uncertainty, it's very easy for you to end up with a situation where, you know, you might have, you know, either all of the doses at, at maybe in some asymptotic region dose response curve or, you know, or maybe all well below where, uh, where good efficacy is or spread just simply too far and wide to really describe the rise uh, in the rise in your dose response curve so making it very difficult to optimize the dose uh, and of course part of this whole mix is because there's also uncertainty of whether uh, whether any dose will translate into therapeutic benefit you've also got a difficult proof of concept com decision to make as part of this also so the question I'm posing then is how would I design uh, an efficient dose finding and proof of concept strategy that's likely to yield relatively conclusive inferences regarding both the no go go no go decision and the dose selection decision. And again, let's take a look at a published example. What I'm going to look at is a dose ranging trial design that uses Bayesian adaptive dose assignment and Bayesian adaptive stopping rules. Uh, the example here is one uh, known as the Aston trial. Uh, ASTIN is an acronym here, and you can see it here. So it's acute stroke therapy by inhibition of neutrophils. Uh, in here, uh, I point out the um, article describing the results of the trial here. Uh, the uh, Mike Krams was the uh, the physician uh, primarily involved in this. Uh, this was a some work done at Pfizer. Uh, let's see, Andy Grieve was the main Pfizer uh, statistician involved, and that the the core theoretical and computational development was done by a couple of folks that are currently at MD Anderson, uh, Don Berry and uh, Peter Muller. The phase two, uh, our phase two dose ranging proof of concept trial, then. Uh, you, want, you know, the objectives here is you want to identify doses for a subsequent confirmatory trial uh, and also, you know, assuming with such a confirmatory, confirmatory trial is even going to be done, but you also need adequate information to make a good informed go-no-go -no -go decision uh, after this dose ranging trial. Uh, the treatments we're looking at is uh, a uh, drug referred to as a neutrophil inhibitory factor. Uh, the study design, uh, you, where we've got the adaptive dose assignment, uh, the, again, there was a very high uncertainty in the uh, where an effective dose might exist, and in fact, the you know again whether or not this neutrophil inhibitory factor would produce any benefit was highly uncertain. Highly uncertain, though there was a plausible hypothesis underlying it. Uh, anyway, they ended up using a, a wide range of doses you can see listed here going from our, our placebo treatment up to 120 milligrams, but with several intermediate doses as candidates within this. Uh, the treatment in this case actually made our uh, adaptive trial a little bit simpler here, or at least it made it simpler for our uh, uh, for the clinical supply people because it consisted of just a single a uh, single dose treatment. It was a single 15 minute infusion administered within six hours of a stroke. So this would be something where a patient would experience a stroke, be brought into an emergency room, uh, and then be administered uh, administered this drug, you know, pretty much on admission uh, into the emergency room. Uh, the endpoint they have here is a measure of function. Uh, you know, of how functional somebody is after having experiencing a stroke, uh, something called the Scandinavian Stroke Scale, which I'll refer to as SSS in subsequent components here, uh, and that was measured 90 days after the stroke. Uh, now that's what the well, that's what the official endpoint was, but uh, that the SSS was also measured at multiple visits prior to that 90 days. So they actually had some longitudinal data they could look at. In fact, that plays a role in our modeling effort. 
So here's uh, a schematic uh, attempting to describe the the trial design, or at least the design of the decisional the decision making process uh, associated with the trial. Again, recall that there's going to be both an adaptive treatment assignment and an adaptive stopping component uh, to this. So let's sort of lead you through this. So we we start out. So we're going to start our trial here. Uh, we've got a a prior model already for our relationship between our doses and uh, sorry between the doses and our and the stroke scale measured at 90 days. Uh, in this case, it's a, a fairly weekly, this is a model that has a fairly weekly informative prior. They were using a pretty flexible uh, model in this particular instance. Uh, I guess I'd encourage you to look at the article to see it in more details, but it was a f sort of a semi-parametric model they were using to describe the exposure response here, or dose response. So, but you start out, you would, you would, attempt to pick an optimal dose for learning about uh, about the ED95. Did I describe, I don't think I described that, yeah. Uh, right now it's probably not critical exactly how they defined the ED95. They had some prior notion of what they thought was uh, where they would want to be on a dose response curve, if you like, and they named this entity an ED95. Uh, it was actually kind of an odd definition that wouldn't be consistent with the way we usually think about it with, say, a, an ED95 on, a, uh, on an Emax model. So we won't go into that. But the, probably the best thing to, the way to read this is just think that what they want to is to find, is to find the optimal dose for learning about the, uh, the optimal dose for treatment. So you've got to get sort of two notions of optimality here. You have... Uh, this hypothetical optimal dose for treating stroke. Uh, but then, as part of the study, uh, though in a sense you'd like to be able to give every patient that optimal dose for treatment, but you don't know what that is, so you first have to learn about what it might be. So during the tr study itself, you're actually going to try and pick a dose which is optimal for learning about the dose response curve in a, in a sense, but in particular learning about the dose response curve in the neighborhood of what they think is the optimal dose for treatment. Anyway, so they're going to pick some optimal dose for learning about that ED95. Uh, they're, they're recruiting patients, so we say we got your next new patient comes in, uh, and that patient is going to get randomized between placebo or that optimal dose we just calculated. Then you treat that patient. Uh, and at various points, you measure the SSS in that individual. So you accumulate some patient data here. Uh, as data is accrued, uh, you analyze the data. Uh, and there's sort of this was sort of a two-stage model. They had a model for analyzing the relationship between uh, longitudinal measures of this SSS and and how that and then using that to impute what the 90 day value was and then using the values from that in order to model the relationship between dose and the 90 day outcomes uh, so when they do this model here uh, where they're going to model dose relative to endpoint uh, for patients where you actually observe the endpoint, you just use their observed values. For patients uh, where you don't yet have endpoint, but you have some intermediate values, you use imputed values based upon modeling that that uh, the relationship between uh, the end or the measurement and time. Okay, so now you've got a model. From that model, you can make inferences about whether or not. Uh, you know enough to decide to, uh, well, whether you know enough about both the dose and whether or not the drug will work in order to move forward to a pivotal trial, your phase three trial. Or another possibility is that uh, you may learn enough to realize the drug is not going to work at any dose within the dose range you have. So if, you're, if that's true, then you would terminate develop and development entirely. 
And finally, the other possibility is that you don't yet know enough to make either decision, which means the decision at that point is to move on and continue uh, recruiting more patients and collecting more data. So you've also you always have then this uh, three-stage rule in in here. And actually, maybe I should clarify even before on this one, when you estimate the dose response model, you're going to estimate the dose response model. You use the dose response model to to decide what, you know, to basically calculate what these, this ED95 is, which they consider the optimal dose for treatment, and, and what that, and what the, and Sorry, and the magnitude of response to that ED95 determines whether or not you pick one of these three paths. So anyway, so if assuming you you ha don't have enough information to pick one of the one of the end decisions here, either transitioning to a new trial, uh, to a pivotal trial, or terminating development, you go on and you go back in the cycle and you do this over and over again as you recruit new patients and observe more data. So that's the basic theme in the adaptive trial. So that's a little bit more detail here. Uh, the adaptive dose assignment strategy, I describe a little bit more here. So what you'll do here is you want to assign a dose to the next patient that minimizes the expected variance of the response to the optimal dose. Boy, was that a mouthful. Uh, so the idea here then is you're trying to learn about uh, the true optimal dose for treatment uh, but in order to do that what you want to do is you want to pick doses that reduce your degree of uncertainty in what that optimal dose is and this expected variance we're talking about is a measure of that uncertainty so you want to pick a dose that's going to max to that'll do the most to reduce the uncertainty in this optimal treatment dose. Uh, this is just making a comment here that in addition there was also a random uh, assignment of 15 percent of the patients to the placebo group in here in order to have a randomization component as part of the trial. Uh, this We have this notion that they were calling the optimal dose the ED95, the optimal treatment dose. Uh, and we've got a Bayesian model then for the uh, response described as a function of dose and time uh, as part of this. Uh, and then we have the adaptive stopping rule where the decision here for our adaptive stopping is based on the response to our estimated or predicted ED95. And here I'm just describing that that response here is a function of ED95. So think of this R as representing the word response. Another, and this response actually is going to be the difference from placebo in that Scandinavian stroke, stroke scale. So the bigger the difference is in a positive direction, uh, the better the patients are doing, and the more likely we would want to take the drug forward for treatment, you know, for further development. So each, so this decision point that I showed you in the cycle was actually done, handled every week. It was done on a weekly basis. And on that weekly basis, they decide among three possible actions. Uh, and here's the rule set they were using. So they would look at the, first they would look at, well, the main thing they would look at is the, their model predicted value for this response to ED95. And if the probability of that, that that response is less than one is greater than 90%, they would stop the trial and abandon development. Uh, now, they also insisted on having a minimal number of patients. They would only stop the trial for, um, for futility if they had at least 500 patients. Similarly, they would only stop the trial for success and move forward to a pivotal trial if they had more than 250. So that was an additional requirement. But the core um, adaptive decision here you can see again was based on this. So if they were 90% certain that the uh, that the effect size is less than one, kill the drug is basically what they're saying. On the other hand, if they are, you know, if they are 90% or more certain that the effect size is bigger than two, 
they would declare success and move on to a confirmatory trial. And then if neither of those things was true, they would just continue recruiting more patients and continuing to observe uh, the Scandinavian stroke scale in this. And then they had threw in an additional rule that the maximum number of patients they would recruit is 1,300. So let's see what actually happened in the real trial. Here's some pictures of those two probabilities. So let me step back real quick. So we're going to look at these two probabilities. This one here, uh, the probability that the response is less than 1 or the probability that it's greater than 2. Uh, looked at another way is this one. The first one you can think of as the probability of failure, if you like, and the next one is the probability of success. So over here, our probability, so here's our probability of failure, if you like. We're looking at the probability that the treatment is ineffective. So this is our, you can see here, it says probability that the response at ED95 is less than one. And here we're looking at, uh, on the x-axis here, we're looking at the week since the first enrollment. So that's the uh, number of weeks since the trial began. And you can see that in what they're, you're plotting then are measures of this probability every week. So every week the data is analyzed that's been accrued. And you can look at that. Excuse me. And what you can see here over time is it bounces around quite a bit during the earlier portion. Uh, and actually fairly early on, we end up exceeding that 90% certainty that the drug is ineffective. But keep in mind, they also had a requirement that they recruit a certain number of patients. So when these events occurred back here, they had not yet re recruited the minimum number of patients. So they kept on going. Uh, basically, they felt there was too much risk of sort of a, a false negative, if you like. So they continued recruiting, but then finally out here, you can see we've got an event out here where, uh, again, that probability out here at about 40 weeks has exceeded, uh, has exceeded that 90%. In fact, I guess that's what I said here. The probability that the treatment is ineffective exceeded 90% at 40 weeks. And at that point, they they curtailed enrollment in the trial. Uh, you know, of course, the patients who were already enrolled in the trial continued contributing data. So you can see as uh, you can see some additional tracings after that, which describes, uh, you know, which is, uh, sorry, which describes the data uh, analysis results uh, uh, for the times after that. And of course you can see it did drop below 90% after a while here, but again, the probability that the, the drug is ineffective by according to this measure is still pretty high. Uh, similarly here, this is the, uh, the reverse measure, basically the probability that the treatment is effective in the sense that the uh, response is greater than two, and you can see that probability stayed pretty low uh, here. So you can see even out here at the very end, it's still right around 5%. So the probability that they meet their effectiveness criteria is quite low in here. So the end result here is they ended up with a pretty unambiguous conclusion uh, that, that the drug was unlikely to, to be of much value to patients. Uh, a few other pictures here. We're looking at, uh, you know, we had that adaptive treatment assignment happening here, and we had this whole range of doses that patients could be assigned to. Uh, and you can see we've got a chunk here uh, of placebos, but recall that's a consequence of the fact we have a, uh, a required 15% of patients receive placebo. Uh, and then you've got a fairly flat region here where, you know, you got a whole bunch of people getting uh, a range of doses here and then a big chunk at the higher doses. And, of course, that's not too surprising. If you've got a drug that's going to be fairly ineffective, the modeling process would tend to assign more of them to higher doses uh, in here, at least using the, the meth methodology they were using. Uh, this is just showing how on this down here in the lower left showing how they were allocated to different doses over time where now the y-axis are the doses the x-axis is the week since uh, patients were first recruited and you can see where what doses the patients were uh, were assigned to uh, as they were recruited over the study 
again, you can see the big chunk in placebo and then uh, somewhat more over here at the higher doses. And then finally, over here on the right hand side, we're looking at a dose response curve. So we're looking at the effect. Uh, in this case, it's, a, it's looking at difference from placebo versus, oh, I guess I lost my thing here, but this is again, this is, um, uh, this is dose down here on the x-axis. And what you can see here is we end up with a certain amount of noise shown by our 95% uh, credible intervals about our posterior mean here. But overall, it's pretty flat uh, in here. You know, there's at best only a slight increment over, over the full range of this. Uh, but you can see that there's not really anything that you could think of as a, a clear dose response uh, as part of this. Uh, given the the high uncertainty and the fact that overall that mean looks pretty flat. Thus again, consistent with their conclusion that the drug was ineffective. So the end result was is uh, they ended up terminating uh, the uh, development of their compound that we called NIF. Uh, they ended up uh, recruiting 746 patients, or actually they had 746 that were evaluable. Uh, and that from the data from that led them to an unambiguous conclusion that NIF is ineffective uh, and further argued that it, had they done a traditional phase two dose finding trial with three active doses and placebo they would have used um, okay I lost part of my sentence here I'm trying to remember what the rest of it was uh, they would have uh, recruited a thousand eighty patients for this and I can't remember what the last I need to check here. I seem to have lost that. Uh, I suspect there was a percent there that, anyway, I've lost part of it. But anyway, it would have been a larger number of patients in here. Uh, and and it's likely it would be less informative about dose response because of covering the dose response uh, space uh, to, a, to a lesser degree. Uh, and it was more likely to leave so I guess part of this is, one, it would have cost you more. Uh, it would have exposed more patients to the risks uh, associated with the new drug. Uh, and it would have been less informative about dose response. And it's more likely to leave an open question at the end about whether untested doses might have been affected, uh, even in doses intermediate in the range that were studied. In this case, they had fairly closely spaced doses, so the only question it could have possibly left open is whether higher doses could have worked. Okay, that's a good point to take a little breath here, see if um, there's any questions there. Okay, we'll keep my eye open here in case something pops up. Let me go ahead and move on to uh, a few other things here. Uh, we're kind of beginning to sort of slide into a, a close of sorts here. Uh, I wanted to hit on what are sort of some closing topics uh, to hit on uh, of a fairly broad nature in terms of uh, Bayesian analysis in general and the, the kinds of methodologies that we use for, for applying it. And sort of go after maybe some que broad questions of, you know, why why Bayesian analysis? And, uh, and as I say this, I guess I'm the, uh, the alternative I'm thinking of right here is mainly maximum likelihood, though there, there could be some other strategies you can consider, but that's the, the main comparator I'm thinking of. Uh, well, first of all, uh, fully Bayesian me or me Bayesian methods provide you with a, uh, you know, a more comprehensive description of your uncertainty and your model parameters and predictions, and do so in an essentially a single stage analysis process. 
uh, unlike, say, the typical maximum likelihood methods coupled with uh, frequentist strategies that, that do it in sort of a two-stage process. Uh, and, in, and in this methodology, in Bayesian methodologies, all of your, basically all of your unknown quantities, uh, your, your, so any estimated quantities, predicted or derived quantities, uh, can be presented in the form of samples from posterior distributions. So you've got that aspect, though this one is, that's kind of a, a probably almost more of a conceptual advantage, if you like, compared to what you get when you're working in a, in a frequentist environment. Uh, the key benefit in Bayesian analysis comes when you're combining new data with prior information. Uh, and that's the context where, where there's a much stronger argument for using a Bayesian method than using it in more general cases where you may be, may be just using weakly informative priors. Uh, so it's again, it's the notion where you can combine new data with prior information. Um, one thing that uh, I point out here is that if you're using maximum likelihood methods for population modeling, for hierarchical models, where you're using approximations to the likelihood function, uh, such as, um, well, at least non-MEM up through non-MEM 6, uh, as well as some of the methods that still exist in non-MEM 7. Uh, for those, there are often series or linear approximations to the likelihood function, uh, whereas when you're using a full uh, MCMC simulation strategy, you're not making such approximations. And for a number of contexts, you end up with improved estimation performance as a result, and that's particularly true for so-called generalized hierarchical models. In other words, m things like models for categorical data often perform better uh, than that. Now, having said that, um, newer methods are coming available. Uh, so, for example, there's a number of new uh, optimization methods in non-MEM7. Uh, there's things like the SAEM method in Monolix, uh, as well as some things that have been incorporated into SADAPT, uh, which do not make such approximations. So, so this is not a uh, this this does not serve as an argument against using those methods. So. Uh, so again, the main reason for considering Bayesian analysis, I think the strongest one again, is if you want to combine uh, new data with prior information. And why not Bayesian analysis? Uh, the biggie is computation time. Uh, it's more computationally intensive than most of the uh, maximum likelihood strategies. Um, so if you're trying to develop a model rapidly. Uh, so, and in fact, I, I guess what I would say is if you need to um, develop a model fairly rapidly uh, and you do not need to uh, explicitly incorporate uh, quantitative prior information as part of the modeling strategy, uh, then you may well be better off using uh, something like non-MEM or some other maximum likelihood strategy uh, for you doing your modeling. Uh, on the other hand, if you do need to bring in prior information, it's probably worth the additional computational uh, difficulties associated with using the Bayesian methods. Uh, the other thing is, is if you're uh, for if you're using a maximum likelihood method and then subsequently using bootstrapping as your device for getting reliable estimates of uncertainty in your various model parameters, uh, you, then the maximum likelihood methods sort of lose uh, lose the computational advantage, if you like, uh, because a, a fully Bayesian analysis may be able to accomplish the same function in a single step and do it with a comparable amount of computation time. So that was kind of the why Bayesian or why not Bayesian. Uh, another aspect here might be uh, you know, is explicitly why, sort of bugs versus non-MEM, in particular bugs versus non-MEM Bayes. And we've, cert we've sort of touched on this already, but I'll sort of reiterate, uh, you know, what you might want to be thinking about here 
in terms of which tool to use to, in order to do a fully Bayesian analysis. Uh, the main advantage to bugs is that it allows a lot more flexible stochastic structure. So there's no restriction on the number of levels of random effects. Uh, there's a lot of built-in distribution functions and it's possible to add more. Uh, and, and because of that rich stochastic or richly flexible stochastic structure, it's a lot easier to combine models for multiple types of data. So for example, you might want to do a meta-analysis where you're combining both individual patient data and summary data, or maybe you want to combine both preclinical and clinical data. So you might have one set of models, you know, that is, uh, say, modeling, you know, dogs or rats or something like that, and you may apply a population model there. And on the other hand, you may have a, a bunch of clinical data that you're going to use a population model in humans, but of course there's not necessarily a direct relationship between the individual random effects in one versus another, so you may want to use a completely different uh, you know, a completely different set of random effects, if you like. And that's not something that's readily done in, in non-MEM, but it's easily done in bugs. Uh, on the other hand, non-MEM provides a nice wide range of estimation methods within the same platform. Uh, so in, in particular, you have available within non-MEM uh, the ability to do, uh, to do estimation of popular, of sorry, of posterior modes. So you can go ahead and use the prior statement within non-MEM and not use the full Bayes MCMC method, but use one of the other optimization methods, which would then give you estimates of posterior modes. And that can be particularly useful during the earlier model development stages where you're beginning to explore maybe a range of model structures um, and you might want to be able to do that fairly rapidly without having to do the full-blown MCMC. And then once you get to narrowing it down to either a single model or maybe a small number of candidates, then maybe move on to using the full MCMC method. Uh, and as you saw in, uh, was, I don't know, was that last week or the week before, uh, that the comparative performance in terms of accuracy, precision, computation time, uh, varies between them, and we find that in some contexts, WinBugs does better and some non-MEM does better. But overall, I was uh, pleasantly surprised the, at the performance of non-MEM and, and kind of reached the conclusion that uh, if you have, if your data is, well, maybe I should say really the model, if the model that you're using is you know, fits within the limitations of non-MEMS model structure, uh, then it's, it's, you know, I would say it's a good candidate to use, and I would have no trouble recommending the use of non-MEM in those cases. Uh, the main places in the limited, ex limited experience we've got so far with the non-MEM based methods uh, where I would not recommend it, but where technically it can be used uh, is... Uh, with mixture models uh, or with models where you're incorporating uh, inter-occasion variability, or in other words, a third level of variability. Uh, Non-MEM did not perform particularly well in those cases. Uh, but in the cases where, where non-MEM has sort of conventionally been used, where you've got two levels of random variation uh, and no complications like mixture models, it did quite well, in many cases better than wind bugs. A uh, few other things to think about. Um, one thing would be, you know, uh, when, you know, if and when to consider using Bayesian approaches where there may be some interface with regulatory authorities. Uh, and here I mentioned that regulatories are still are, are, sorry, are still skeptical of Bayesian analyses in pivotal trials, at least for. And here I'm thinking of Center for Drugs. Uh, in devices, it's another story. They're actually uh, quite interested and accepting of well-conducted Bayesian methods, but in but at Cedar, um, uh, there's still a lot of skeptical skepticism about using Bayesian analysis for pivotal analyses. Uh, but 
you know, there have been statements made uh, in a number of open contexts now where some key FDA people uh, have indicated more openness uh, to using Bayesian methods. Uh, having said that, um, you know, they are, they're still likely to demand good frequentist operating characteristics for your Bayesian methods. Uh, as you know, and also uh, some assessments of the sensitivity to both choice of prior distributions and model structure uh, as part of this. So you may have to go uh, a few steps beyond what you otherwise would do for uh, for addressing those particular issues. Though, as I comment here, uh, looking at those aspects of your methodology are generally good practices anyway. It's just that you're going to have to be particularly diligent about it if you're going to use it for a, uh, for a regulatory application. Now, having said that about pivotal applications, I'd say there's also for increasing acceptance and even encouragement of model-based approaches, whether they be Bayesian or otherwise, to aid decisions like dose selection and trial design. So for things other than the sort of pivotal uh, approval decision, I don't think you should hesitate, <coughs> excuse me, hesitate to use Bayesian methodologies in those instances. I think you'll find that in most cases they'll be reasonably accepting. Uh, of using those kinds of methods. Uh, something we didn't spend much time talking about is is how to specify prior distributions. We we touched on it here and there, but I just wanted to sort of reinforce uh, some of this and and you know because in many of the examples as we've been talking, we kind of threw out prior distributions, uh, but without really exposing much thought behind them. Uh, when in fact uh, there should be a lot of thought behind uh, your con the construction of prior distributions unless I make the statement here that proper construction of prior distributions is or at least should be hard work uh, you know and saying that construction of informative prior distributions is a somewhat subjective process even when it's based on hard evidence uh, because even in those cases, there's usually some subjectivity on the selection of evidence used to support uh, that prior distribution. Uh, stakeholder agreement on, on your prior distributions and the model is a prerequisite for their acceptance and any inferences based on them. So even if you've been working in a non-Bayesian context up to this time, I'm sure you've had to uh, you know, if you've been using a model to try and help aid decision making in in clinical drug development, uh, you know that you need to uh, to make a case for the model that you've used. Well, if when you're bringing in a Bayesian method, and now we've got priors as a component of the model, you have to realize that that's a, that's also uh, a a component here that you need. Uh, to provide evidence and arguments to support. Uh, and as a comment here, we've again, we've touched on this a little bit, is that seven, sensitivity to the choice of priors should be evaluated even when using supposedly uninformative priors in order to, uh, uh, to make the case that they are in fact uninformative in those instances. Oh, uh, let's see. Okay, I know where I was going here. Uh, just uh, mention a few things that are going on uh, at Metrum uh, that have to do with trying to address some of the limitations uh, in the use of Bayesian methods in pharmacokinetics and facilitate the use of those methods. Uh, we're regularly involved in the development of computational methods and some open source software tools for Bayesian modeling and simulation that's relevant to pharmacometric applications. Uh, some of our efforts, uh, you've actually seen the, the fruits of some of those uh, that I've labeled as short-term efforts, uh, you know, things like uh, development of our the Bugs Model Library. Uh, some short-term things I've got on the books right now is porting that to open bugs. Uh, earlier on in the course I touched on open bugs and then that is likely to replace win bugs fairly shortly, certainly within a small number of months. Um, 
you know, we, uh, part of this is also in the Bugs Model Library. You've seen that some of the steps are a little bit tedious, uh, and so one of the things we're working on is automating some of those processes uh, and also incorporating some more built-in models uh, as part of it. Uh, another thing that we've spent some time on is some tools for distributed computing of multiple chains uh, in our Bayesian analyses so that you don't necessarily need to so well so that you can speed up the process of analysis by being able to distribute those chains to, to multiple processors and we do make available a, a tool called Bugs Parallel it's a piece of software that uh, uses a couple of tools out there well it uses R in particular and a um, uh, and a particular message passing uh, methodology called MPISH2 here. It's a type of MPI uh, for message passing between processors and computers uh, and we created sort of a modified version of R to win bugs that distributes uh, MCMC chains across multiple processors. So those are some things that are are there or, or in the works. Uh, some longer term plans that we've got uh, is the main one here is to develop a more comprehensive platform for Bayesian modeling and, and simulation. Uh, one of the issues here working with bugs for example that I touched on as we compared it with uh, with non-MEM is bugs is strictly uh, an MCMC simulation tool. It doesn't provide us with other tools that might uh, enhance the efficiency of developing Bayesian models. So what we'd like is a framework that not only does MCMC but also allows us to to do estimation of posterior modes in order to uh, improve the speed with which we can do some exploratory modeling. Uh, and But we'd also like the greater generality or flexibility that you see with wind bugs compared to compared to what you see with non-mem. So non-mem does provide both MCMC and estimation of posterior modes, but it does so in a, in too restrictive uh an environment. Uh we'd like that to be an open source piece of software with somewhat greater platform development uh than bugs does. Uh we'll probably interface it with R. We'd like support for parallel computing as part of it, and then uh, a suite of, uh, of tools for analyzing the MCMC samples once you've generated them. And of course, part of what we do is, is provide short courses in Bayesian modeling for pharmacometric applications. Uh, we're coming close to the close then on our sort of our intro course in uh, Bayesian modeling and simulation, and currently we offer two other courses. Um, one on looking at categorical and an analysis of categorical and time to event data in a Bayesian framework, uh, and the other one doing model based um, meta analysis for various uh, drug development applications, again using a Bayesian framework for that. Uh, let's talk a bit about what we what we haven't covered. And in fact, that's going to lead me to uh, what, I'm, what I plan to talk about in our last session next week. Uh, so what we haven't we talked a little bit last week about categorical modeling categorical data, uh, but that was fairly limited uh, in terms of what we covered. As I mentioned, we've got a more extended course that covers a wider range of categorical uh, and time to event data. But anyway, we haven't often in pharmacometric applications we encounter ordinal data, in other words ordered categorical data, we encounter count data and time to event data uh, and that's something that we haven't talked about. Um, we've done a lot of MCMC simulation in order to characterize posterior distributions but we but though that's pro pretty much something we do as part of the model development stage and about the only way I've used um, other simulations is just to check model fit. Uh, let's see, Hong, it looks like you have a question that I flew right by here. Let's see. Let me get that before I finish this. Okay, so you say a question regarding PBPK modeling and simulation. Whoops, pushed the wrong button there. There we go. 
uh, how to construct differential equations and wind bugs. Okay, I suspect you missed a lecture in there. Um, I had actually, um, uh, if you look at uh, our example four, uh, that um, so it's a, what's referred to as hands-on example four uh, in the lecture materials. Uh, it actually that example does use differential equations in this instance. It's not a it's not a full blown PBPK model, uh, but it uh, but it is using um, uh, user specified differential equations as part of the Bugs Model Library tool. So uh, take a look at that as well as I forget exactly which lecture I covered that in, uh, but there was one lecture where I focused on. Uh, uh, doing user written models in bugs model library and that is covered in there so the short answer is yes you can do it uh, in fact right now we're f we're working on a uh, fairly complicated model of calcium homeostasis uh, that involves let's see I think we're up around forget how many differential equations there are in that now but it's well over 30 at this point uh, within that system of differential equations, and uh, we're actually doing that in WinBugs uh, using Bugs Model Library as the interface to it. So, so the short answer is it is possible. Uh, and again, go back to um, a couple lectures ago here, and you'll find some background on that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, I was talking about. Yep, yeah, we hadn't. I hadn't really talked about taking the. Um, the MCMC samples that we get and actually using them for other simulations, for example, doing trial simulations uh, based upon that, well, trial simulations that consider uh, the uncertainty uh, in the model parameters. And that is quite possible uh, in here. And in fact, that was what I was going to focus on. Uh, next week is probably I'm not going to do a, I don't think I'm going to do some full-blown trial simulations but I will illustrate how you can take the MCMC samples that are generated from wind bugs and use them for doing simulations in R so in fact up to now when I've done these simulations for model checking I think in every case I've done it where I've done the simulations in bugs itself here we'll take the MCMC samples and then do further simulations in R uh, to illustrate how you can you do that and use it for inferences. So I will try and fill this particular void in what we haven't covered, at least in part. Uh, the Another thing we haven't really talked about is dealing with missing data. Uh, and missing data both in the sense of having missing dependent variables or missing covariates. Uh, it turns out that the missing dependent variables is the easy one to deal with uh, and in a sense we've dealt with it in the one special case where we had censoring but I haven't talked about it otherwise uh, but the one I definitely haven't talked about is dealing with missing covariates. Uh, unfortunately the Bayesian framework provides a particularly convenient framework for dealing with some of that so we, we're not going to have the opportunity to talk about it but if you start dealing with that kind of a problem there I encourage you to take a look at some of the literature on how to deal with that uh, and finally uh, there's uh, there's a lot of work out there on the use of decision analysis in a number of contexts specifically Bayesian decision analysis uh, and uh, for for things like, uh, let's see, let me just check something, be right back with you. Okay, well let me keep on going here to a close here. It sounded like somebody was probably trying to get a hold of me by Skype. Let me just take a quick peek here. Okay, it's nothing that has to do with the course, so let me move on. Uh, anyway, so decision analysis, you've already seen me touch on it with one of the examples we talked about today, but there's uh, a number of opportunities for use of decision analysis uh, in, uh, sorry, decision analysis and drug development, particularly things for like picking optimal doses. Uh, during drug development, so I would encourage you to take a look at the literature on that. Uh, I think I actually, let me 
quickly flip down to references because I think, yeah, sort of the classic reference to that here is uh, James Berger's uh, book here that I list here. Uh, I'm sure there's some good ones subsequent to that that I haven't drug into that one, but I found that one particularly useful uh, in terms of understanding uh, Bayesian decision analysis. Uh, okay, so I guess maybe a little bit about where we're going to be going next week here. So next week what I'll do is I'll spend some time talking about uh, doing simulations uh, given the MCMC samples that you get out of out of wind bugs and how we and how you can use them so spend some time on that and that will pretty much bring us to a close uh, I don't have a hands-on assignment for uh, for this week's lab session so uh, especially since I'm going to be running around on the road that day anyway uh, I'm actually going to be canceling that that particular lab session. Uh, however, next week what I'll do is I'll spend some time on simulation and actually give you an assignment for doing some simulation work here. So I do plan on having uh, both a lecture and a lab session next week. Uh, the other thing I need to think about is, um, is we're going to have a final uh, exam uh, coming up. Uh, I've been debating whether to post it sort of before the Christmas holidays or after. Uh, I would say if anybody has any opinions on that, feel free to express it. Uh, and if I don't hear otherwise, I'll probably try and get it there so that people could work on it over that break. Uh, but I don't know what's best for most people to be able to work on it in the break or to be able to put it off until afterwards. Uh, so again, feel free to uh, express your opinions on that. Uh, and otherwise, I guess, uh, see if any other questions, nope, I guess I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring it to a close at this point then uh, until next week.